Well, greetings, brothers and sisters. Uh, it really is good to have this opportunity to have fellowship uh, with you. Uh, in this conference, our general subject is God's economy in faith. And uh, I have to admit that before recently, uh, I did not pay that much attention myself to this, the, these two words in this phrase, in faith. God's economy is in faith. This is, of course, from 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 4, where Paul charges his young co-worker to uh, stay there in Ephesus and to charge certain ones not to speak different things, but rather to stay on the line of God's economy, which is in faith. And in the past, of course, I paid attention, I think many of us, to God's economy. We have to stay on the line of God's economy, emphasize God's economy, his dispensing for the accomplishing of his purpose. But it's a key, it, it is key, brothers and sisters, uh, a key to enter into the experience of God's economy is to latch on to this phrase, in faith in faith. You know, in the New Testament, <clears throat> we are referred to as believers so much, much more than as Christians. Actually, uh, the word Christian is used only a few times in, 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 in the New Testament, whereas believers or those who believe is mentioned so many times. We are believers. We are those who are in faith. Why is this so important? Because Faith is a realm in which everything of God's economy becomes real to us. Outside of this realm, outside of this, this organ, this function that, that brings all these things to, to substance, that we can, we can touch these things. Apart from faith, God's economy is, is not real to us. And the enemy one of his strategies, maybe key strategy, is to weaken the faith of the believers. You just consider, even in your own experience, there are times when, when we, maybe we have felt, oh, I just love the Lord so much, I'm full of faith. But there are, there are other times, there are other times when things happen, and we are maybe weakened or discouraged, and, and our, our faith our, it seems like our faith has leaked out, or at least has become very low. Have you not, not experienced this? You know, I, I was uh, uh, been touched recently with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, where, you know, uh, Thessalonians, this book, Thessalonians, we know that this group of believers that, uh, that, that Paul and the brothers uh, spoke to, and they raised up this small this church in, in in Thessalonica then very shortly thereafter Paul writes the first letter to them so we could consider that this is the youngest uh, church that was addressed by by by, by Paul and and uh, uh, he writes to them he writes to them uh, actually even in the whole letter he writes to them about uh, faith love and hope faith love and hope but in chapter 3, he says something very, very, very specific. In chapter 3, it says in verse 5, because of this, when I could, I could bear it no longer, oh, was such, such feeling, I sent to find out concerning your faith, lest perhaps the tempter, the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So, so Paul sent Timothy to go to see not just how they were doing in a kind of a general sense, but to see how was their faith specifically? What was the level of their faith? What was the health of their faith? So I'd like to ask you, dear brothers and sisters, not just how are you, but how's your faith? How's your faith? Is your faith healthy in the Lord? Why is this so crucial? Because if our faith is not healthy, Oh, the things of God's economy are not realized by us. 
are not substantiated by us, are not touched by us. We need faith. We need faith. In the same chapter, in verse 10, uh, let's see, he says, he says here, um, night and day, petitioning exceedingly, so that we may see your face and complete the things that are lacking in your faith. Paul wanted to see them face to face. For what? Not just because he missed them to be in their presence, but he wanted to complete the things that are lacking in their faith. To Paul, faith was paramount. Faith was so important. The faith of the believers. In Luke 18, 8, it says that when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Saints, we, we do believe. I think we, we, we are seeing that the, the situation around us, we are so close to the ending of this age and to the Lord's return. And as, as time goes on, as we march toward, toward the end, so many things around us, so many circumstances, the enemy uses them how? To weaken the faith of the believers. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, I want, I, I, I pray that in this conference, by the speaking of the word of God, your faith would be strengthened because faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So I hope that even in this hour, you, you would be under the hearing of faith and your spirit of faith would be energized, would be strengthened. I'll touch this a little bit later, but in 2 Corinthians 4.13, it talks about our spirit of faith. Oh, to exercise faith, we need the word. We need our spirit, our spirit. Anyway, saints, up till now, we've seen, we've seen the, the governing and controlling vision of God's economy in faith. That was in message one. And in messages two and three, we've seen the intrinsic significance of faith. In this session, we come to a most marvelous point. Now, it has a long title, but I'm just going to summarize this way, is how can we have faith? How can you and I actually experience faith? That's what this lesson is about. So we, we come to the, to the fourth uh, uh, outline and, and the title uh, there, and uh, Anyway, wherever you are, especially if you're together with, with, with others, uh, please, you can read along and exercise your spirit of faith as we're reading. The title is Running the Christian Race so that we may obtain the prize by looking away unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And of course, this message is based on, let's see the first two verses in the scripture reading, Hebrews 12. One and two. Concerning faith, these verses are key in the whole Bible. Actually, in Hebrews chapter 11 and these verses in chapter 12 are a big key to our experience of faith. And, and, and this message actually has only two Roman numerals, even though it's several pages long. There are only two Roman numerals and the two Roman numerals are these two verses. So, so verse one is Roman numeral one, verse two, which we'll spend longer time on, is Roman, Roman numeral two. So let's read, let's read the word. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So it's good to read the word even out loud so that others can hear it and you can hear it as well. Okay, Roman 1, which is Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, let us also, having so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, put away every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and run with endurance the race which is set before us. Okay, let's, let's continue reading. A, the cloud is for leading people to follow the Lord, and the Lord is in the cloud to be with the people. In Greek, witnesses implies the sense of martyrs. You know, it, it, here we have this, this, uh, this picture. There's a cloud of witnesses 
surrounding us. We are the ones now running this race. The Christian life, the Christian life is a race when we develop this in this point. The Christian life is a race. Sometimes we talk about the Christian walk, but, <laughs> and that is true. The Bible does say walk by the Spirit, but actually this walk is a race. And in this race, in this race, we are, we are the ones in the race. And here there's an allusion to a kind of an arena. And we're on display as we're running this race. And who are the spectators? The witnesses. We have a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. But who are those witnesses? Who are those witnesses? Very interesting. The witnesses are all those who have already finished the race. They, they've, they've all run. You know, in, 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 if you go to some kind of sporting event, uh, it's not the case that every one of the spectators has actually participated in the sporting event. So if you go to a, to a football match or what Americans call soccer, uh, it doesn't mean everybody in the stands that's watching, they actually played. They're there cheering their their team on. But in the Christian race, everyone who's cheering us on has, has already participated in the Christian, in the Christian race. And they're, and they're cheering us on because their completion depends on us today. How we run the race affects all who have gone before us. Oh, this is this is actually quite remarkable. And, and actually, uh, here we point out that Greek in Greek witnesses implies the sense of martyrs. Many of those are the ones, many of those are the ones who gave their lives, gave their lives, their physical life for the Lord. Why? Because of faith. Because of faith. They saw the unseen things. But all the witnesses are the ones who have given up their soul life for the Lord. Okay, we'll keep reading. One says, with the people of faith, we can have the Lord's presence and his leading. All, all the people of faith, the church people, are the cloud. The best way to seek the Lord's presence is to come to the church. Brothers and sisters, even though we're, we're running this race, that we're, we're not alone. We're not alone, and we're not competing with the other brothers and sisters that we're sitting with here. We're not competing with them. We're encouraging each other. Yes, on one hand, the, our, the race is personal. On the other hand, it's corporate. Our running is, is personal, but the race is really corporate. We need others to, to, to go on with. If, if, if anyone is seeking the Lord's leading, he must follow the cloud, the church. The Lord is in the cloud, meaning that he is with the people of faith. You know, we see this in the Old Testament. The Lord led his people by the pillar of cloud. Follow the cloud. You're following the Lord. So praise the Lord. He is with us, with his people. He's with his people. To what? To strengthen us, to go on in our, in our journey. Since we are the people of faith, we are today's cloud, and people can follow the Lord by following us. Those who seek him can find his presence with us. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, I do hope this, we, this is our reality. That is, we're following the Lord by running the Christian race, strengthened by the cloud of witnesses, others along the way, others along the way. When they want to seek the Lord, they, they realize the Lord's presence is with us. So we just, they, they, they follow us. They follow us. I did this. I followed some into the church life. And I've been following for many years now, following many years. The Lord's presence is with us. B says, the Christian life is a race. Every saved Christian must run the race to win the prize. The prize is not salvation in the common sense but a reward in a spiritual sense. The Apostle Paul ran the race and won the prize. Of course, we should, we should realize our salvation. I, I think uh, 
probably the majority of us know this, our salvation is once for all. We have the eternal salvation. But, but the Lord in his wisdom, as a, as a wise father, as a wise father, even in the remaining verses in Hebrews 12, it, it, it says that the Lord is our father and, and he disciplines us for our good. He disciplines us because he wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. And every wise parent has a kind of system of reward and discipline, reward and discipline. The reward and the discipline are incentives to help us to grow. So we have the common salvation. So we're with the Lord. We will be with the Lord for eternity. But there is an incentive to those who grow faster in the Lord, to those who mature faster, to those who, who finish their, the race in, in, in the proper way without being disqualified. You know, in the, in the, the race, in the, for example, the Olympics or some competition, there, there's always rules about staying within the lane and, and not interfering with, with others running. And if you, you break the rule, you get disqualified. You get disqualified. So, so there, are, there are incentives for running properly. And in, in the Christian race, it's the same. Oh, that we would all run for the prize. And we have these verses here in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9 and in Philippians 3. Uh, Paul talks about the prize, the prize. We need to run to get the prize. Okay, one says, an encumbrance is a weight, a burden, or impediment. The runners of the race strip off every unnecessary weight, every encumbering burden, that nothing may impede them from winning the race. The unique struggling sin in this context was the willful sin of forsaking the assembling together with the saints, of giving up the new covenant way in God's economy, and of going back to Judaism. Both the encumbering weight and the entangling sin would have frustrated the Hebrew believers and restrained them from running the heavenly race in the new covenant way of following Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the enemy all the time, all the time, wants to frustrate us from running the race. And, and there are so many factors, possibilities in our lives that the enemy could use to what? Weigh us down. Weigh us down. The, here, there are actually two categories of, of factors that uh, distract us or, or slow us down from the race. One, one, one is the encumbrances, the things that weigh us down. The other is the sin which easily entangles us. Some of us may still be dealing with some sins. Of course, here in the context is the unique sin was the matter of forsaking God's economy, forsaking the assembling together. But the enemy has his tactic for every one of us. Oh, dear saints, run the race. Some of us, as I said, might be dealing with some entangling sin, something that we have been maybe dealing with even for a number of years, but have not been able to overcome. Oh, how we need the Lord's grace. We need the Lord's grace to, on one hand, confess all our sins. Confess all our sins. Remember, remember, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life. We need to not only confess, we need to then eat the Lord, enjoy the supply, so that we not only are cleansed from sin, but that we can overcome sin. Then there's the category of encumbrances, encumbrances, things that weigh us down. You know, in, in, in Luke, the Lord the Lord says that uh, the, the Lord gives a strong warning that at, at, at his coming, we would not be weighed down by the anxieties of life, by debauchery, by, by uh, the things of the world. You know, anxiety can weigh us down. 
And as this conference is for the working saints, oh, dear saints, anxiety, anxiety concerning our living, anxiety concerning our future, anxiety concerning ch our children and their education, anxiety con uh, concerning so many things related to our living can weigh us down if we're not careful. If we're not careful, these things will, if they don't disqualify us, at least they slow us down. That we're not even, we're not running, we're not even walking, we're just standing still in the Christian, in the Christian race. So all the time we have to cast our anxieties on the Lord. Even every day, brothers and sisters, every day. You know, in the in in the picture in the in the Old Testament, in, in Exodus. When we see at the beginning of Exodus that the, the Pharaoh, who was a type of Satan, uh, was, was, was threatened by the increase of Israel. And he wanted to, to uh, uh, damage God's people. He had a twofold attack. The older generation weighed them down with their living. The second generation, the younger generation, even killed them, killed the male boys, the boys that are born, and then the girls, eventually, as they grow up, there are no male children, that they, they have to marry, who would they marry? They marry Egyptians, so there'd be mixture. So you see, with the younger generation, it's death and mixture with the world. But with the older generation, it's already related to their living. Oh, brothers and sisters, we, we need to realize the enemy's tactics, stratagems have not changed through all of the centuries. The enemy wants to weigh us down with anxiety. We have to be those who, who, who unload, breathe out all our anxieties on the Lord so that, so that the, the God of peace can guard our hearts and our thoughts in, in, in Christ Jesus. Let's continue. So he says, we need to run with endurance, asking the Lord, to direct our hearts into the love of God and into the endurance of Christ. Oh, this is a this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful verse. Second Thessalonians three five, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the endurance of Christ. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord that that we have the supply of the the love of God and the endurance of Christ. You know, I mentioned earlier that all those who are witnesses, who are cheering us on, they all passed, they all participated in the race. Actually, in these verses, you see in verse, in verse two, the Lord Jesus himself finished this race. He's the one who cut the way before us, and he's now the captain of our salvation. And that's why he's qualified to be the author of our faith, the author of my faith. So we can, we can tap into the endurance of Christ. We don't, we don't need to work up something on our own. And this is a big point in this, in this message, that we're not the source, brothers and sisters. We're not the source of faith. We're not the source of love. And we're not the source of endurance. But there is a source. There is a source. And we have access to the source. Praise the Lord. One says this love is our love toward God issuing from the love of God that has been poured out in our hearts. So I'd like to ask you, do you love the Lord? Well, you might say, amen. I don't know how strong. If we were in person there together, then I'd, I'd know how strong. But sometimes we feel, oh, we love the Lord. Amen. Lord, I love you. Other times, don't we feel, mm, well, not as much as yesterday. Oh, Lord Jesus, actually, brothers and sisters, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. You have love in your heart right now. That's Romans 5, 5. 2 Timothy 1 says that you have a spirit of power and a spirit of love. So at any time, you can say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I do love you. And you're not hypocritical. Praise the Lord. This is a fact. And we stand with the fact. And we exercise our spirit of faith 
to speak the word of God. My heart is filled with the love of God. Not, not oh, I feel like I'm filled. It doesn't matter. At any time, you can say that, Lord Jesus, I love you. My heart is full of love for you. And it's a fact, not hypocritical. This endurance, too, is to endure with the endurance of Christ that we have enjoyed and experienced. Brothers and sisters, we have a wealth of supply of love and endurance, the love of God and the endurance of Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, Roman 2 says, looking away unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Praise the Lord. We can live the Christian life, run the Christian race by looking away unto Jesus with undivided attention, by turning away from every other object. I'll come back to this point. Many of these subpoints here are taken from that wonderful note on, uh, on this verse, and I would, I would direct you to that, even to read that later and, and spend time to pray over the, 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 this note. The wonderful Jesus who is enthroned in heaven <clears throat> and crowned with glory and honor is the greatest attraction in the universe. Amen? He is like an immense magnet drawing all his seekers to him. Amen. We can, and we can pray this right now. Song of Songs 104. Draw me, Lord. Draw me. We will run after you. Lord, if you don't draw me, I can't run because I'm not a source. I'm not a source, Lord. Draw me. Three says, it is by being attracted by his charming beauty, loveliness, pleasantness, delightfulness, that we look away from all things other than him. And we have here Psalm 27, for one thing I have desired of Jehovah, that will I seek, to dwell in the house of Jehovah all the days of my life, to do two things. And the first is to behold the beauty of Jehovah. And that's the first thing. The second is to inquire in his temple. But the first is the first. Before inquiring, we should just behold. Just behold him. Behold his beauty, his loveliness, his pleasantness. Spontaneously, we have faith generated in us. We have, and we are in God's economy under his dispensing. Such a transaction with the Lord generates faith and brings us into the experience of God's economy. Without such a charming object, how could we look away from so many distracting things on earth? Oh, and dear saints, there are so many distracting things, aren't there? There's so many distracting things in the world, in the world situation, many things, the news, many things. But the things we love, the things we like to do in recreation, now sometimes this is the world's distracting things, isn't it? <laughs> so many things can come through that, through this little portal. Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord, draw me. I want to see you again as that charming one. Draw me, we will run after you. <clears throat> B says, Jesus is the author of faith, the originator, the inaugurator, the source, and the cause of faith. In our natural man, we have no believing ability. But when we look away unto Jesus, he, as the life-giving spirit, transfuses us with himself, with his believing element. Brothers and sisters, what I just read there is the gospel. It's good news. Hasn't the enemy ever lied to you? That, oh, you don't have enough faith. Actually, you should tell the enemy, of course I don't have enough faith. I don't have any faith. What I need to do, and you're reminding me right now, I thank you for pointing this out, is that I need to go back to the source. So get away from me. Get Move aside. I need to look at Jesus. So we go to the word. When we sing a hymn, or we just call on the Lord, or we go to the meeting, 
And what happens? Faith. As soon as we exercise our spirit of faith, faith is generated. Faith is our experience. And God's economy is tangible again. Don't allow the enemy to lie. Oh, you don't have enough faith. Oh, you're too weak. Actually, we, in ourselves, yeah, that's true. We don't have enough faith. Actually, we don't have any believing ability. So this is just a kind of sign, a little symptom, a signal. Oh, I need, <laughs> I need the word. I need to go come back to the word. Or, eat. of course, we have a lot of the word deposited in us. And we can, we can just recall a verse. Lord, oh, you're my refuge. Lord, you're my refuge and my fortress. There's a verse I enjoyed the other morning in Psalm 91.1. Oh, I'm hiding here, Lord, under the, I'm, 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 I'm dwelling in you. You're my dwelling place, Lord Jesus. And I'm hiding under the shadow of your wing, and you're my refuge, and you're my fortress, Lord Jesus. Faith, then I, I suddenly, suddenly, it seems like out of nowhere I have faith. Actually, it's not out of nowhere. It's from my spirit of faith. And it's from Jesus as the author of faith. The question is, what am I looking at? What direction am I facing? When I face myself, no faith. When I face the Lord, faith. When I face the word, faith. When I come to the meeting, faith. You know, in Luke, there's a woman who has a disease a condition. She's bent double. She's bent double. That means that she's not only like this, looking at the earth, but she's like this, all looking. She, she only looks at herself <laughs> or at the earth. When she looks up, she's looking at the earth. We don't want, we don't want a condition like that. We want to stand erect. The Lord says, stand erect. Look up. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's the author of our faith. And when we look at him, his believing element is transfused into us once again. C says, then spontaneously a kind of believing arises in our being, and we have the faith to believe in him. This faith is not of ourselves, but of him who imparts himself as the believing element into us, that we may, that he may believe for us. That's, that's the gospel. He comes as the believing element to believe for us. It's not try to believe. Conjuring up, oh, I need to have more faith. Yes, yes. Uh, well, maybe we encourage each other. Oh, have faith. Saints, what we need is to look away. Don't look at the environment. Don't look at the situation. Look at Jesus, and you have the faith. Just like Peter on, on the water. You know, he, when Peter was walking on the water, the Lord was on the water. P Peter and the disciples on the boat, they think he's a, a, a phantasm. A, 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 and, and then he says, don't fear, it's me. It is I. It is I. And the Lord, Peter says, Lord, call me to you. If it's you, call me to you. You know, Peter, Peter could not just get on the water. He needed the Lord's word. The Lord speaking. His, his walking power was the word of the Lord. The Lord said, come. And, and you know the story. You know the story. As long as he was looking at Jesus, he, he was on the water, overcoming. But then it says, and he saw the wind. He took his eyes for a moment off the Lord to the wind, to the environment, to the situation. And he started to sink immediately. But thank the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Lord didn't let him sink. The Lord didn't say, oh, you of little faith. He, by the time the Lord would have finished the sentence, Peter would have been under the water. The Lord didn't do that. He, the Lord held, held him, saved him. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior. He is the believing element within us. He comes into us to believe for us. This is the faith of Jesus Christ in Galatians 2.20. It's not only faith in Jesus, but the faith of Jesus. Praise the Lord. 
D says, faith is Christ himself believing for us in a very subjective way. He transfuses us with himself, working himself into us until he, the very person, becomes the believing element in our being. Thus, it is not we who believe, it is he who believes within us. In this way, he makes us a believing being. Apparently, it is our believing, but actually it is his believing. This is genuine faith. Oh, brothers and sisters, I hope we see something here. We just need to look away, Lord. I just need you. I don't need to try. I just need you. Lord, I come to you. I come to you. Now here, I'd like to take a moment to come back to uh, point A that we, we read above in the page here. It says, it says here that um, we can live the Christian life, run the Christian race by looking away unto Jesus with undivided attention by turning away from every other object. And I just like to talk about this phrase for a few minutes, undivided attention. Saints, my, my main burden in this fellowship is to encourage us all to just go to the Lord, to be, to be before the Lord, and especially to spend time with the Lord, particularly in the morning as we set the direction of our day. Now, I know that many of you um, invest the time, I I'm sure, to have morning revival. But I'd like to ask you, do you have your time with the Lord in morning revival with undivided attention? Or at times, maybe even often, your attention is quite divided. Have you never had this experience? Maybe, maybe you're praying, you're praying <laughs> oh, 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 over, over this verse. Looking away unto Jesus. Oh Lord, Lord, I look away unto you. And then all of a sudden it's, oh Lord. Oh no, wait, do I have an appointment today? Oh yes, I think I have a dental appointment. Wait, is, what day is today? Yeah, I think it's today. Oh my goodness. Oh, I have to rearrange my schedule. And you spend, spend three minutes in the mind. Does this never happen to you? Or has it never happened to you? And then you don't even realize when you stop praying and started thinking. And then after some time, you're, oh, 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 Lord Jesus. Oh, amen. Amen. Oh, Lord. Then you say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Oh, Lord Jesus. No, saints, this is the enemy's tactic. This is the enemy's injecting his thoughts into us. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says that, for, that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. His schemes. You know, this word schemes can be translated as thoughts. The root of this word is thoughts or plots. His schemes his strategies, his plots, his thoughts. Do you know sometimes his thought comes to us? He reminds us of things. It could be this, oh Lord, I love you. Oh, I wanna run with endurance. <gasps> oh no, I forgot to call brother so-and-so. Oh, he's going to be so upset. Oh, maybe I should text him right now. Oh, don't do that you, because brother so-and-so is having his morning revival now and you, you will distract him. Oh, and then brother so-and-so, he's having his re re morning revival and his phone, ding, or a little light starts flashing. And, and you just interrupt it because, oh, we have this kind of uh, Im impul uh, impulsive nature that, oh, we have to check who, who, who contacted me, who texted me. That's why I encourage you, put your device on silent, put it away, put it aside, or you will not have, the Lord will not have our undivided attention. The enemy always tries to call our attention away. So not, we're not beholding. Him. We're not gazing on the Lord. Why? Because he wants to interrupt our faith. Because he knows, he knows we're not the source of faith. And we need to always come back to the source. So if you're spending 10 minutes with the Lord, Consider in your past experience, 
Isn't it possible that seven of those minutes were spent going from one to the other, one thought to the other, and then we repent. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, I come back to you. No, don't repent, saints. Don't repent for that. Just come back. Just return and go on. Because you're, you don't have to repent for his thoughts. That's Satan's thought. That wasn't your thought. Just return. Oh, Lord. Lord, I love you. Amen. Looking away to Jesus. Run with endurance. Just don't waste the time. But, but I have found this in, in the past years even studying this matter somewhat with saints everywhere and different age groups, I've, I've discovered that probably the number one deterrent to our fellowship with the Lord, to our, to our ability to look away to Jesus, is our undisciplined mind. Thoughts, scattered thoughts. And they don't have to be sinful. It's not that these are, well, sometimes there are sinful thoughts that come. That's true. Maybe even in a dream that we had. And we're praying, oh, Lord Jesus. And that just kind of rises in us. Does that never happen? A dream comes back and then you feel, oh, Lord. And you're, it's like your whole countenance sinks. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, it says we need to take captive every thought unto the obedience of Christ. So as that thought comes as a kind of a cloud, negative cloud, a dark cloud, not the cloud we were talking before, the cloud of witnesses. This is a dark cloud. Sometimes it's a sudden thought. At other times, it's just a, like, a, like a gradual bringing our inner being down. We can say, no, say, no, not today. We can speak from our spirit of faith. We can say, no, that's not my thought. Lord Jesus, I love you. Lord, I want to run with endurance. And you just continue to, to pray read over the word or to pray or to sing. Anyway, I hope this fellowship could be a, a, a help to, to all of us. The Lord wants our undivided attention. But this is a key. You know, uh, our Christian life is really a cycle. The more we spend time with the Lord in our personal time, the more we will abide in him in our daily living. And the word will abide within us. You know, in John 15, the Lord said, abide in me and I in you. That's in, uh, in, in, in John 15, 4 and 5. But then in the following verses, he says, what? My words abide in you. Let my words abide in you. A, a very practical way of of." Having the Lord abide in us is to let his word abide in us. And then, and then he also says, abide in my love. So how do we abide in him? By abiding in his love. How does he abide in us? By his words abiding in us. So if in the morning we say, Lord, I love you. Oh, I want to eat you. Oh, thank you. My robes are washed. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life. I claim my right to the tree of life. I eat you. I come to you. Doesn't matter what I did, how far away I was, Lord, I'm eating you now. Then during the day, we can abide in his love and his word will abide in us. We abide in the logos and the rhema abides within us all day long. Then even throughout our day, we're looking away to Jesus and we'll be more prone, more equipped stronger to exercise our spirit of faith that that when the distracting things come we'll recognize oh lord i don't want to stay where i am i'm going to stay where i am again maybe maybe during the day we're checking our device updates on things and and we just get a sense within mm, a dryness uh, uh, a little darkness we realize oh lord oh lord i got off the lane of the christian race lord i come back I come back. Saints, if we're having fellowship daily in the morning, that is uninterrupted, that the, the, the quality of our time is increased. And this is really my point, that the quality of our fellowship with the Lord would be strengthened and increased. Then in our daily life, we'll be keener 
K-E-E-N, keener, to realize when we got off the track. And then the more we abide in the Lord, oh, I tell you, the more ground we give to the Lord during the day, especially at night before we go to bed, the less ground we give to the enemy, the less ground we give to him to, in, to inject the thoughts the following morning. So it's, it's a cycle. Our daily life could st actually strengthen our personal fellowship with the Lord, and our personal fellowship with the Lord strengthens our daily, daily life. But in our time with the Lord, in our fellowship with the Lord, oh, I pray that we could have uninterrupted fellowship, and he could have our undivided attention. I hope we would practice this, saints. I hope we would practice to keep our eyes on the Lord in spite of the injecting of Satan's thoughts. Okay, let's continue the reading. We're here in point F. Point F says, F, uh, faith is a substantiating ability, a sixth sense. The sense by which we substantiate gives substance to the things unseen or hoped for. Of course, this was touched a little bit uh, in earlier messages. Substantiating is the ability that enables us to realize a substance. The function of our five senses is to substantiate the things of the outside world, transferring all the objective items into us to become our subjective experience. Of course, we're talking about the five physical senses. Uh, as an example, three, as the eye is to seeing, as the ear to hearing, as the nose to smelling, so faith, our spirit of faith, is the organ whereby we substantiate everything in the unseen spiritual world into us. Saints, our sp spirit is a spirit of faith. Faith and our spirit are really synonymous now. So you could say faith is an organ within us that touches the unseen things. That's why in the midst of all the chaos going on in the world today and people are unsettled and there are wars and, and various things and calamities, why can we have stability? We're not shaken by these things. Why? Because we see the unseen. We see God's throne. We see that God is still on the throne and in control of everything. Our faith is in him. And we see actually the Lord working through all these things. Incredible. Oh, to be a person of faith is, is really liberating. Praise the Lord. Let's see, four says, in the divine and mystical realm of the consummated spirit, we can exercise our spirit of faith with the spiritual sense of seeing the Lord. And we have various verses talking about our spiritual seeing, hearing him, touching him, tasting him, and smelling him, <laughs> even smelling him, praise the Lord, being permeated with him to such an extent that we, be we become a fragrance of Christ. With our Christian walk in love, being a sweet-smelling savor to God. Furthermore, as his loving seekers, we eventually become mature in life to the extent that we have a spiritual intuition and olfactory sense of high and sharp discernment in order to discern things that are of God and are not of God. Praise the Lord. There's too much here. I, I, I don't have the time to develop any, any of these points. But we have the spiritual seeing we have the spiritual hearing, we have the spiritual smelling, we have the spiritual tasting, we have the spiritual touching. Praise the Lord. Faith as the substantiation of things hoped for assures us and convinces us of the things not seen. Therefore, faith is the evidence, the proof of things unseen. One says, we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await it through endurance. We're not the source of faith. We're not the source of endurance. We look away to him. 
we contact him and he becomes the faith, love, and endurance in us. Our life should be a life of hope, which accompanies and abides with faith. We should be those who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, who beyond hope believed in hope. Dear saints, the Christian journey is, is not an easy one. I think we all know this by now. Some people would think, oh, you become a Christian and with the, with the kind of uh, false hope that then everything will be okay. God will bless you and everything. But in the witnesses of faith that are listed in Hebrews 11, some said, it says about some, these died in faith. They were sawn in two. They were burned. The Lord didn't save them in that way from those sufferings. But they died in hope. <laughs> Can you imagine? They died. They died full of love. That, that was the motivation. They died full of faith. Without wavering. Without wavering. Praise the Lord. Three, now this is a, a, a also a strong burden I have in, in, in this message. We need to exercise our spirit of faith in order to walk by faith and not by that which is seen. We do not regard or look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Saints, we have to exercise our spirit of faith. Our spirit is full of faith. For says the Christian life is a life of things unseen. The degradation of the church is the degradation from unseen things to seen things. We should not have the thought that if a person that has faith will be able to perform miracles, will be able to do great things. A person who has faith can see the unseen things, can see God working behind the scenes even apparently sometimes not answering the prayers of his children, not rescuing them from the outward calamities, but still operating for his economy. And when we see that, that's powerful, saints. That's powerful. We should not allow the degradation to come in, to be governed by seen things, to be governed by miraculous things. The Lord's recovery is to recover his church from things seen to things unseen. H says, Jesus is the perfecter, the finisher, the completer of our faith. As we look away unto him continually, he will finish and complete the faith that we need for the running of the heavenly race. We all have the same faith in quality, but the quantity of faith we have depends upon how much we contact the living God so that we may have him increased in us. And saints, again, I come back. This is what I told you is my main burden, that we would spend time, spend time with the Lord, quality time with the Lord, looking away to him. God has allotted to each a measure of faith. That's Romans 12. We all have the same quality of faith. But why is it that some just are at peace? Some are uh, as it says in Acts 6, 5, full of faith. Why? Because they've been contacting the source of faith. And you have just as much, much access as that saint. Don't think that they're special in that way. You have the same right. You and I have the same privilege. You and I have access to the same blood. Same cleansing blood the blood of sprinkling that brings us into the presence of God so that we can what? Just behold him, enjoy him, linger there, wait on the Lord, be saturated with his beauty. Praise the Lord. Faith, is, uh, uh, A says, faith in the progressing stage comes through our contacting the triune God who is faith in us. <clears throat> The way to receive such a faith is to contact its source, the Lord, the process and consummated God by calling on him, praying to him, and pray reading his word. 
Saints, this, this all seems very basic. Calling on him, praying, prayer reading. I would add singing. But the point is not these practices. The point is contacting the source. And I realize that sometimes we have the practice without the contact. May the Lord rescue us. That we would not just have the external practice without the intrinsic contact. Oh, Lord Jesus, I hope every time we call, we're calling from our heart. And we behold the beauty of the Lord. C says, when we contact him, he is overflowing within us and there is a mutuality of faith among us. We are encouraged to the faith that is in one another. And as I mentioned at the beginning, in the Christian life, we need encouragement. We're running personally, but we're not running alone. And we need to encourage one another's faith. Encourage one another's faith. We need the mutual encouragement of faith. Because sometimes I slow down. As it says in Hebrews 12, my hands are hanging down and my knees are weak, even paralyzed. And I need to be strengthened by you. But, but next week, maybe you get discouraged. So I strengthen you. Oh, so we need the companionship to go on. We need to strengthen one another's faith. He says, our regenerated spirit, our spirit of faith is the victory that overcomes the Satan-organized and usurped world. The great, irrepressible, and unlimited power of faith motivates thousands to suffer for the Lord, risk their lives, and become overcoming sent ones and martyrs for the carrying out of God's eternal economy, which is in faith. All those in Hebrews 11, they are the ones that had faith motivating them all the way till the end. And they're cheering us on, letting us know it's possible. It's possible. It's possible for us today to continue, not to give up today, but to have the faith to go on another day. Sometimes that's all, all we can expect, faith to just go on another day. The great irrepressible and unlimited power of faith motivates. Amen. Okay, I says, according to Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. The Lord Jesus knew that through his death, he would be glorified in resurrection, and that his divine life would be released to produce many brothers for his, his expression. For the joy set before him, he despised the shame and volunteered to be delivered to the Satan usurped leaders of the Jews and Gentiles and to be condemned by them to death. Therefore, God highly exalted him to the heavens, seated him at his right hand, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, made him both Lord and Christ, and crowned him with glory and honor. If we look away unto him as such a wonderful and all-inclusive one, he will minister himself as heaven, life, and strength into us, transfusing and infusing us with all that he is, so that we may be able to run the heavenly race and live the heavenly life on earth. In this way, he will carry us through all the lifelong pathway of faith and lead and bring us into glory. Praise the Lord. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, I hope, I hope that through this speaking, we could be strengthened in our faith, motivated to do what? Just to spend time with the Lord and to recognize, to recognize the enemy's tactics. The enemy's tactics is just this, to take our eyes away from the Lord, to see the wind, to see the environment. It could be a dist something distracting just in our personal life, in our family life. It could be at work. It could be in the church life, in our group meeting. It could be even, even to focus saints, even to focus on the condition of the church takes our eyes away from the Lord. The condition of 
some of the saints. Don't, don't look to the saints. Look to the Lord. And he will strengthen us. He'll draw us. He'll draw us. And saints, I, I, want to, I want to leave you with this verse, which is, we didn't highlight it in, in the message, but it, it, is, it does appear there. Hebrews 4.2. For indeed, we have had the good news announced to us, even as they also. But the word heard did not profit them, not being mixed together with faith in those who heard. We're under a lot of speaking in the Lord's recovery. Thank the Lord that his speaking is not rare in these days. So we do have the Lord speaking. And brothers and sisters, God's economy has been spoken to us. But why is it that at the moment, in the situation, very often, God's economy is not real? We don't sense that we're under the dispensing. We, we get drawn away to other things. Well, it says here, points out, we need to mix the word with faith. We need to respond to the word of God with faith, with our spirit of faith. And 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, I have believed, therefore I speak. And we should speak the word of God to stand with the facts in the word. Then faith is generated, even to say, oh Lord, amen, hallelujah. We'll engage our spirit of faith. And we need to speak. We need to speak, Lord, you are the author of faith. Lord, thank you. You're the perfecter of my faith. You will complete my faith. Don't believe the enemy's lies. And we can say, Lord Jesus, I love you. My heart is full of love. Why? Because your love is poured out in my heart. Romans 5, 5. We just stand with the word. But not only stand with the word, speak the word. When we speak the word, oh, even faith is generated within us. Not just those that maybe we speak to. Even ourselves, our faith is strengthened by our own speaking. So I hope, saints, all these words that we're receiving in this conference, we would mix them with faith. Mix them with faith. Pray them. Speak them. Speak them first to ourselves, and then speak them to one another. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He is the author and perfecter of faith, strengthening us, strengthening us to run the Christian race. Amen, dear saints. Grace be with you all.